sleep. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of some of them. Nope. He delivers his people out of all in, of them. This is why the psalmist says in the same chapter as he begins this, he says, bless the Lord, O my soul. He says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises shall continually be in my mouth. This is a man with an experience with God. As Ravenel says, an experience with God that costs nothing is worth nothing. Be ready to embrace affliction. Be ready to embrace affliction. Is it time to embrace affliction? Hi, Sean Isaac here. Welcome to another day of daily nuggets of wisdom. Uh, this morning I was thinking about some of the difficulties and trials that my family and I have faced just in the last, I'm going to say, two months that are on top of COVID-19, on top of the political division that's through our nation and trying to be salt and light in the midst of that, on top of the racial division that's throughout our nation, on and offline, in the midst of all the things going on, there's still more afflictions. <laughs> and so I wanna encourage you, my nugget of wisdom today is, I wanna encourage you to embrace affliction. And by embrace, I don't mean that you just accept it and passively bow to it in submission to the sovereignty of God. That's not what I mean by embrace. When I say embrace, I'm saying accept that affliction, trouble, trial, difficulty is normal. And if you don't do that, I think it will make you a complainer, a murmurer. It will cause you to question God. An inability to, to embrace affliction as part of the life of not only every human being in general, but in this case, more specifically for the child of God, can send you down a path of throwing away your faith. See, the Bible says we're kept by the power of God through faith. Though God is the keeper, Though God is the one who regenerates us by the power of his spirit, though he's the one that gives us the grace, we must still do the work. Paul says, I labor more than them all, yet not I. It was the grace of God that was with me. So God's grace empowered Paul to work out his salvation with fear and trembling, to do the work of ministry, and so on and so on. So I want to talk to you about this idea for just a few minutes. I'm actually on my way to the hospital. Many of you may not know this, so I want to kind of bring you up to date on some of the things that have been going on in the Isaac's life. And I'm sharing this because I woke up this morning thinking about Psalm 34, which says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Now, let me just start by saying what this is not saying, and then I will talk to you a little bit about why I believe this text came to mind. And I decided to med meditate upon it this morning. So what it is not saying, it is not saying that you should just you know, many are the afflictions of the righteous. This is not saying that unrighteous people don't go through affliction. It just takes a cursory um, perusal or reading of the word of God to know that that's not, that is not what this is saying. Job says in Job 14.1, says man that, are, that is born of woman 
is a few days, meaning life is short for every person born of woman and full of trouble. From Job's perspective, based on eternity, in comparison and contrast to eternity, which is forever, our time on earth is few days, and Job described it, describes it as full of trouble. When you look back on the, t uh, on the, the lifespan of the average person, depending on what you're focusing on, you can describe your life as full of trouble, right? Through much tribulation, the book of Acts says, we must enter the kingdom of God. The Bible is filled with language. Jesus, when he gives the teaching on the building of your house on the rock and not the sand, says, why must your house be built on the rock? Because the winds blow and the rain come and the storms come and the tsunami comes and trouble comes and the difference between the righteous and the unrighteous, one builds his life on the rock and so he or she is able to stand when the trouble comes and the other builds his life on the sand. And the destruction, I'm paraphrasing, is great, right? That may lead to that person taking their own life. See, when you don't embrace affliction as normal, you may despair to the point of death and I'm going to say provide an environment or capacity to think about suicide as an option. I spoke to a young man uh, maybe Thursday of this week whose wife decided after 20 years of marriage she wants nothing to do with him anymore. Now, that's the only thing I was told in the beginning. And the way he worded the situation, I think, I can't judge his heart, but I think he wanted me to not only empathize with him, but feel sorry for him. Because the conversation went something like this. Like, oh, we've been married for 20 years. Uh, you know, we've sat with our pastor. I love this woman, blah, blah, blah. And, and he, it's almost like he wanted me to say, what's wrong with this wicked woman? Why would she leave you? He started crying in the call. I allowed him to express his emotions. I was sensitive to that. I didn't try to shut him down. But then I asked him what happened. And I, I knew there must have been that the average woman is just, not just going to decide to leave you. What did you do? And he shared, you know, there was a period of unfaithfulness in their marriage. And, uh, you know, I, I, I mentioned that just to say that he wanted to describe what he was going through as an affliction and the end of the life, end of the world for him. He talked to me about how he wasn't able to reach me that night. Um, but when he got me the next day, he began by, I was going to take my life last night. If you don't arm yourself with the mindset that putting on the armor of God is so that you can stand in the evil day, then you may provide an environment and give yourself the capacity where it is easier for you to receive the fiery darts of the devil, which come in the form of, well, woe is you, woe is me, sounds like Elijah. There's no one righteous, it's all bad things are only happening to me, and so I'm gonna take my life. I'm not knocking the thought of feeling like ending your life, but I am knocking the idea that taking your life is reasonable, justifiable, or okay to do as a child of God. Now, it's okay to do if you're a professing Christian, but just because you're a professing Christian doesn't mean you belong to Christ. Because I believe many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of some of them. Nope. He delivers his people out of all in, of them. This is why the psalmist says in the same chapter as he begins this, he says, bless the Lord, O my soul. He says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises shall continually be in my mouth. This is a man with an experience with God. As Ravenel says, an experience with God that costs nothing is worth nothing. When you have an experience with God, God will sustain you through trial. God will sustain you through trouble. 
He says, David, who has gone through much trouble, much suffering, much difficulty, whether it's in relation to his wives, in relation to his children, children hating him, following him, seeking to kill him, his enemies seeking to murder him, being understood by those who were under his authority, being disrespected by those who were under his leadership, and as citizens of his nation, David has suffered much. But he says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. So this is not saying that only the righteous go through troubles. And I share that because I hear Christians quote this verse as if woe is us because we're the only one that's going through trouble and praise the Lord, many are our afflictions. Please pat us on the back and make us feel good about being a Christian. Get rid of that bad theology. The Bible says that the, tr the way of the transgressor is hard. There are troubles and trials that transgressors experience that Christians do not experience. There are some things that are worse for the unrighteous. Now, you may not be aware of it because they're not transparent and open about their trouble and their trial. They don't have a community where they come and confess their trouble and their trial so you can pray for them. But that doesn't mean they don't feel like taking their life every other day. So I don't want to get off there. I can, but I just want to say this. This text is not saying that only the righteous go through affliction. This text is not about woe is us and our lives are so difficult. Please, Lord, why do bad things happen to good people? That's not what this is about. This is about soldiers don't embrace that type of thinking. And when you're a child of God, you must think like a warrior. You must think like a soldier. The, the, the Bible says that, the, that we must take the kingdom by force, right? The language of being a soldier is throughout the scriptures. Paul says no soldier entangles himself with the affairs of this life. He's not saying this is just the mindset of the preacher or the pastor or the teacher or the bishop or the minister. He's saying this is the mindset of the child of God. So, quickly, a couple things that have happened in the last two months. Some of you have heard that my wife, about how many months ago? Was it two months? Eight weeks? Okay. About eight weeks ago, I get times wrong, so I'm only asking her. You don't even know she was next to me. But about eight weeks ago, my wife broke her leg in two places, fibular and tibular, is that what it's called? Something like that, tibular and fibular. Okay, I, I, I know one is off, but you guys know what, what the two are. They don't sound exactly alike, but in my mind they do. So she broke her, that's the, 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 the place, that's between the knee and the ankle. Freak accident, walking from the foyer, which is a tile floor, into our garage, which is a wooden floor, steps out steps on something not sure what she stepped on and fell backwards trying to catch herself bent her leg and broke it in two places scream in uncontrollable pain share with me i think yesterday or the day before she felt like she was going to die because of this difficulty mind you she was just in the middle of doing a 30-day challenge on sharing how she's gone through cancer five or six times in the last 18 years and sharing with people how the Lord has delivered her and sharing with people what the Lord has given her in the way of knowledge of health and nutrition, lifestyle, lifestyle change, the power of prayer and all the benefits and all the things that are necessary to maintain health. It's not as simple as just lay hands on me, pray for me, I am healed. No, that is often what God will use, but that's not how God will often maintain your health. Often you need to make changes to your lifestyle. Within about three or four weeks, that same broken leg got infected. Back to the hospital again, hospital again. She spends about four, four nights, three or four nights, five nights maybe in the hospital, right? To get that infection uh, under control. Many of the afflictions of the righteous. I'm just talking about the last two months. Well, this past, this week, Thursday, my wife heads out, my wife and I head into New York City with where her oncologist is. And uh, which is about an hour and 20, hour and 30 minutes from our home. And, uh, you know, so we're going the whole day. But that morning we get up, my 12 year old is complaining about stomach pains. She's having stomach aches. She's not able to eat. 
talk to her throughout the day. She doesn't get up out of bed. She's not eating. She's not able to drink much. Every time she drinks something, she ends up vomiting. We think she has some kind of virus. I explore throughout the day. Maybe I'm going to take her to urgent care. Should I take her to the ER? I'm not sure. Maybe this is just a stomach virus. I am going to let her write it out. Mommy and I decide we're going to let her write it out. We get home about six o'clock from, from being at the doctor's office all day, taking care of Deborah's stuff. And Jasmine, 12 year old Jasmine is still in pain. Uh, nothing's getting better. We have this rating, you know, on a scale of one to 10. What number are you at? Are you a six, a seven in pain? She's a seven when I left. She's a seven and a half or an eight when I get home. We give her some natural stuff. We know a lot of things about natural things and, 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 and um, uh, nutritional supplements and other things you can do to help the body strengthen and heal itself. Thinking she just needs enough sleep and rest, get a lot of water. This, whatever it is, it's gonna pass through your system. Eight o'clock, 8.30, nine o'clock. What is your, what is your, what's your number at now? I'm at an eight, eight and a half. Daddy, please, are we going to the doctor? I decide, let me take her to the ER. About 1.30 a.m. Friday morning, doctor comes back in after blood tests, after EKG. Heart is beating uncontrollably. She's at like a 250 plus. Whatever it is, it's a crazy number. Uh, a number of other symptoms. Doctor says, I have bad news, Mr. Isaacs. I have good news. Usually me, I like to hear bad news first. Give me bad news. She decides to give me the good news first, realizing now that if she, I realize now, if she gave me the bad news first, the good news is insignificant. It's not really good news unless you couch it in the way that she did. She says, the good news, Mr. Isaacs, is we found out what the problem is. The bad news is your daughter is type 1 diabetic. What? Type 1 diabetic, yep. That means she, doctor's, doctor's words, she will have to be on insulin for the rest of her life. Now, I'll just as a side note tell you a little bit about me and the way I think. No one can tell me what what anything is going to do or be except God, right? He's the only one that's immutable. That means he's unchangeable. Everyone is limited in their knowledge and information. And though they're, the basis of their knowledge comes from experience and many years of education and learning, and I respect that, doctor, you can't tell me this is what it's going to be, right? So anyway, as a side note, I will, if there is a solution, if there is a way, for a type one diabetic outside of a miracle power and working power of God and healing power of God, there's a way for, for that person to be healed without that. And we're going to pray for that healing. I encourage you to do that. If you love the Isaacs family, remember us in prayer regarding that. All right. What I'm going to say is if there's, if there is a way to do it by God's grace, Sean's going to find it. So with that being said, that's what's led me to this text. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Broken leg, Lily. infected leg. Lily, you can you can get out now, sweetie. Infected leg, and now type one diabetic. By the way, all these things have changed our life, right? Changed our life. We're on our way to the hospital right now, where uh, by God's grace, you know she'll be able to come home today. But. I'll get it. You got it? You can reach it. She'll be able to come home today, but um, obviously it's going to require adjustments from us and from the whole family. So I'm going to make this a part two because there's a lot more I want to say and could say. But let me just give you a couple of preliminary things. A few preliminary things. So again, many are the afflictions of the righteous. The purpose of the text is not to focus on the, the afflictions as unique. The purpose of the text is to, fo to focus on the deliverance as unique. There's a, there's a conjunction. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but... See, that's the emphasis of the text. The text is not Joel Osteen, have your best life now. That's not what this text is focused on. The text is also not, woe is me, and why does bad things have to keep happening to us as God's people? This text is not Elijah whining like a baby, a grown man, not knocking him. I'm just using my words for effect, okay? I can't stand next to Elijah, okay? 
Elijah was a man of God. I have no idea what I would have done if Ahab, if Ahab and his wife were running after me, especially his wife seeking to kill me, Jezebel. With that being said, this text is not about going in some corner and rolling up in a fecal position, fetal position, and whining about how bad things happen to you and God, why, where are you, God? The text before this verse, verse 18 says, the Lord is near to those who are of a broken spirit and a contrite heart. God is near. Now you have to choose. I mean, are you going to believe that or not? When you go through difficulty and it breaks your spirit and it produces contrition and it makes you mourn before God and it, it shows you your limitations and it makes you cry out to God for mercy, cry out to God for wisdom, cry out to God for grace, cry out to God for favor. This text, the text before says that the Lord is near all those who are of a broken spirit and a contrite heart. And sometimes God will allow affliction, God will allow difficulty, God will permit and even ordain and bring it into the life of the Christian. I don't believe God ordains every trouble you have. That's bad theology. Just like I don't believe every trouble you've experienced is from the devil bad theology, right? All these simple, quick fix answers that are running throughout the body of Christ and through teachers and even theologians leave God's people handicapped because it's only the truth that makes us free. And if you believe all of your trials come from the devil, you'll spend every all night and all day binding and loosing and fighting the devil. And he'll laugh at you and say, Paul, I know, Jesus, I know, but I don't know you. I don't know why you're giving me so much credit. If you believe all your trouble and trial is ordained of God, you take Calvinism to a extreme, and many Calvinists do, where they believe that every trouble, trial, difficulty, affliction that comes into the life of the child of God is ordained by God. Meaning, God not only permitted it to happen, God brought it into your life. Bad theology. Now, I'm not saying that the steps of a good man are not ordered by the Lord. I'm not saying that God doesn't, that God is not in control of our life when we go through trouble and difficulty. But if you take that position, you don't allow, allow room for you making bad decisions. See, the same Bible that said God says in Ephesians 1.11, God works out all things after the counsel of his own will. The same Bible that says in Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good, right, to those who are called according to his purpose, is the same Bible that says don't lean on your own understanding. God would not tell me not to lean on my own understanding if my understanding could not be faulty. And, and if my understanding could be faulty, that means I can make a bad decision based on that understanding. So... I am going to wrap up this um, as part one, and I just want to want to leave you with this idea that again the text says many are the afflictions of the righteous. The key word here that makes this text powerful is but, but the Lord, not the doctor, not the psychiatrist, not the lawyer, not the pastor, not the parent. It is the Lord that delivers the righteous out of them all. A couple questions you should ask if you want to fully and better understand this text. Number one, who are the righteous? We'll address that. Lord willing, another time. Who are the righteous? Number two, what does God mean by delivers them out of them all? What does that mean? What does he mean by deliverance? It's obvious, according to Hebrews 11, that 11, many of the saints died in faith, quote, not receiving the promise. So they didn't receive what God had promised them in this life. But yet they died in faith, trusting and believing. Bad theology will tell you you only have trouble because you don't believe. You only have difficulty because you lack faith. You only have difficulty because you don't, you don't, um, you don't know, uh, there's all sorts of bad things, you know, so many, so many bad, think, bad thinking. I don't want to get into that because we'll be here all day. I just want to leave you guys with this. It's time to embrace affliction. And by embracing it, I'll talk about it further. It doesn't necessarily mean that you passively lay down and uh, passively lay down and accept that this is just your portion. 
uh, we're not passive, we're fighting. The fact that I said to you, I'm on a research to figure out all the things that could be done to make life better and easier for us and my daughter as she deals with this uh, diabetic diagnosis. Well guys, that's my nugget of wisdom for today. I'm gonna call this one of many, I don't know. Maybe I'll do two or three. But if something resonates with you, let me hear your thoughts. Leave some feedback, leave a comment, share, like. That's how I know if it's worth investing my time to do it. Have a good day, guys. Welcome to another day of daily nuggets of wisdom. My nugget of wisdom is embrace affliction. Embrace affliction. I'll get into more detail about what I don't mean and what I do mean. God bless.